I'll briefly introduce um, Ken uh, for this event first. Um, so Ken Liu is an American author of speculative fiction. Um, his story, The Paper Menagerie, is the first and only work in history that won three major science fiction awards simultaneously, namely the Nebula, Hugo, and World Fantasy Awards. He has also won top genre owners abroad in Japan, Spain, and France. His debut collection of short fiction, The Paper Menagerie, and other stories have been published in more than a dozen languages. One of his short stories, Good Hunting, was adapted as an episode in season one of Netflix's uh, breakout uh, adult animated series, Love, Death, and Robots, and AMC's Pantheon, with Craig Silverstein um, as executive producer, adapted from a, an interconnected series of Liu's um, short stories. Um, and Ken, I hope you don't mind we record this lecture so we can you know, share this um, with other folks who couldn't join us today in this particular time. So um, yeah, so the yeah, floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming. We we are so excited, every one of us here. So um, yeah, welcome Ken to USD. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yu. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, you know, I don't have um, a very elaborate thing prepared. And since you have read my story, I thought I would just take 15 minutes or so to talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, to tell you the story behind the story because it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so I wrote the story uh, at a time in my career when I, you know, I had been published, but I wasn't um, uh, I wasn't a pro professional writer or a full time writer, um, anything like that. Uh, I had gotten a few stories published here and there, um, and I was interested in um, getting more recognition. Um, and the way it works in industry is when you are just starting out, you write stories on spec. Uh, what that means is you're not writing stories um, with the idea that somebody's going to pay you for it, meaning you write the story, but you have no idea if someone's going to pay you for it. You're writing it on speculation. You're just trying to create something and hoping that you could sell it. Um, later on, when you do become a pro writer, most of your stories are gonna be solicited or by imitation. Uh, somebody actually promises to pay you before you write the story. Uh, but when you start out, that that can't be the case. You're just gonna have to write things on spec. Um, and what would happen is there are periodically new markets opening up, new magazines, new anthologies, um, and they would put out a call for submissions to invite writers who are not represented and who are not established to submit their stories and, and try to break in. And I received an invitation from an anthology uh, calling for stories about um, wizards. Um, it's a anthology of wizards. Um, and, you know, the way you go about this is um, you learn over time how to write to a theme. So what needs to happen is you need to write to the theme and yet you can't stick too either too close or too far from the theme, right? Because readers, when they're buying an anthology of wizard stories are expecting a certain kind of thing. You need to give them that kind of thing, not totally cliched, but also not too far from what they were expecting. If you stray too close to the tried and true, it's boring. But if you stray too far from what they're expecting, then it's not what they signed up for. And that's not good either. So trying to uh, steer a course between being too far and too, too, uh, too close is actually quite difficult. And it's one of the things you learn over time as a professional writer, um, how to do this. Um, now, I had always had a habit of going too far. And um, so I wanted to try to write a story that's about a wizard, but would be as far away from your traditional image of what a wizard is as possible. So that's how I came up with the idea of a mother who is able to use her magic and bring origami animals to life. Um, so that was the original idea. And then I thought about, you know, so that's that's my character, but what what is the actual story? Um, and at the time, I was reading a lot of personal narratives by women who would be described um, uh, colloquially as male order brides. Uh, now, this is a very unfortunate aspect of uh, modernity. Um, 
the global south um, and the developed world has this um, relationship that is tangled up and it is manifested um, in the fact that some women from the global south um, in search of a better life uh, would become so-called male order brides. Um, now, in the developed world, women like these are often uh, mocked. They're just ridiculed. They're treated as some sort of joke. Um, and uh, I've always felt that this is deeply um, unjust. Um, they're immigrants, really, like any other kind of immigrant. Uh, and their stories are personal, moving, and unique. Um, and reading these personal narratives uh, was extremely moving. I mean, think of the courage it would take to leave behind everything you know, to take a chance on finding um, a stable marriage, perhaps even love, uh, by moving across the border, um, all in order to try to have a better life for yourself and for your family. Um, it's an incredible uh, act of courage that I, I really don't know how many of us are capable of. Um, and to read about these women's journeys and, and how they try to um, figure out a way to create a space for themselves in their new homes, trying to connect with their new husbands, trying to raise a family, trying to figure out how to navigate the huge amount of prejudice that they have to struggle against. Um, it's, uh, it was incredibly moving. I, I learned so much. Um, and then I realized that, you know, the the wizard of my story would have to be one of these women and it's gonna have to be her story um the story itself didn't take that long to write um i was able to come up with the idea and execute it fairly um quickly um now i don't think it would surprise anybody here that the story was rejected um <laughs> It was just too far from what people were expecting uh, in terms of wizards. Uh, and uh, I think the editor was correct to reject it. It just was too far from what readers were expecting. Now, if I myself were trying to do an anthology like this, I probably would take it. But I've had a long history of bending themes uh, so far that they are almost unrecognizable. Uh, it tends to be one of my trademarks. I, I, I take genres and I bend them so far out of shape that people refuse to acknowledge that I'm even inside the genre. Um, my career is defined by that. Uh, one of the stories that I wrote that was nominated for a bunch of awards, uh, it didn't win any, but it was nominated, um, was called The Bookmaking Habits of Select Species. And I remember when that story came out, um, a lot of people were very angry with it. They were like, how did, how can this story be nominated? It's not even a story. Well, it's not a story because it's written in the form of a fictional anthropology ethnography paper. Um, it's a survey of different species. Um, and so some people get really bent out of shape um, when you write fiction in that mode. Um, and they were very unhappy with it. Um, the paper menagerie itself too got a lot of um, people upset because they're like, it's it's not science fiction, it's not fantasy. Where's the magic? What what is the magic? Um, well, I never claimed that it was a fantasy story. Um, it's a magic realism story. If you really want to put a label on it, but I don't particularly care much about labels. Um, so anyway, if people want to complain about me and genre, uh, I, I let them, um, I don't really care. Um, if they want to put labels on things, that's their uh, business. Um, I have no patience for labels. Anyway, so I wrote the story and then I couldn't sell it to the market I was trying to pitch it to. Um, so I ended up having to submit it to other markets um, and just try my luck. And I was very lucky that Gordon Van Gelder at um, fantasy and science fiction, one of the most established magazines in the field, um, enjoyed the story. And he uh, bought the story. Um, and uh, one of the things about Gordon that I really like is he doesn't make a lot of changes to a story that he buys. If he buys a story, he pretty much publishes it as is. I think he made one suggestion to me, which is to swap the first two paragraphs in the story. So the in the version that you read, what is now the first paragraph used to be the second paragraph, I think. Um, but that's that's probably the only major change that he recommended, which I agreed with and I undertook. Um, and that and after that, uh, the story took on a life of its own that I could not have anticipated, both good and bad. So on the good front, um, you've all heard about how it got all this recognition. 
Um, and I can't deny that the story had a huge influence on my career. Um, it's a story that a lot of people who know nothing else that I've done have read. It's a story that um, people often, um, you know, when people want to ask you for a favor, they come to you and they claim they've read, you know, something by you. And this is a story they often mention that they've read. Um, and uh, it is, in some ways, um, the story that will become associated with me um, uh, as a as a uh, keystone work, if you will. And um, it opened up a huge number of opportunities for me uh, because the story is not dragons and wizards fantasy. And because the story is not rocket ships and computer chips science fiction, it's sort of nebulous, right? It's, it's magic realism, it's this nebulous place. Um, that actually uh, is a good thing for a lot of reasons. Now, people in the field, often there is a small group of genre fans who really hate stories like this. They, they, they really hate it. Um, because they think that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a fantasy story. It's not a science fiction story. So why is it being published in genre magazines? They don't, they don't think it's genre-ish. They think it's too literary. Um, but that turns out to be an advantage in a lot of ways um, because um, I agree. I mean, the story could be published in a literary magazine. And so for that reason, a lot of uh, international literary festivals invited me um, as, as a guest. And so I got to represent the U United States. Um, going to all sorts of international festivals. And it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I would fly out to France or, or, or Spain and, uh, or Singapore, and I would meet up with the local State Department um, diplomatic attaché, the cultural attaché, and uh, often the State Department sponsors part of my trip. Um, and then we have a discussion, and then it's really fun to sort of meet the local fans and talk to them about um, you know, the spread of American literary culture and the place of American literary um, culture in, in the world. Um, and I got to meet a lot of wonderful readers and writers from all over the world uh, as a result of traveling around, uh, largely because of the paper menagerie. Um, it's the story that people know me for. So those are the positive parts. Um, now, there's also a lot of negative aspects. Um, so, when when it first started happening to me, I was actually sort of amazed. Um, I, I, I didn't quite know how to handle it. So I was um, at a literary festival in Hong Kong, um, which because it was you know a literary festival devoted to literature um, in English, um, most of the attendees were expats, not local residents in Hong Kong. So they showed up and one guy stayed after my talk and came up to me and said, you know, I, I'm I'm surprised. Um, you know, I thought it was your story, but you're not you're not like what I expected. And I I, I didn't know what he meant. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, you know, I I you're not biracial. I I I thought you were Jack. And I was like, huh. Uh, I was actually amazed. I didn't know quite how to handle this because it never occurred to me in a million years that somebody would read a fiction story and think that it's some sort of autobiography. Um, did the fact that there were paper animals coming alive not give you a hint that this is not real? I, I'm, I'm not sure what else I could have done to make it clear it's fiction. Um, and uh, the, the, the reader was actually sort of insulted. He, he sort of acted like I had lied to him in some way. Uh, yes, fiction is all about lies. Um, and I don't know why you found, you thought I was, I, I mean, it, it's fiction, I don't know what else to say. Um, but this reaction actually came to me quite a few times and it's very it's very weird and I don't know quite what to do with it. There's something very weird about the way we handle diversity, especially in the US where writers from minority backgrounds are expected to write nothing but autobiography. So they're, so a white male writer gains power by the power of imagination. Right. Um, if a white male writer writes about whatever, um, the idea is they have the right to tell whatever story they want, and they're doing so by the power of imagination. But a minority writer or a woman writer or an LGBTQ writer 
if they write a story, it must be based on their personal autobiography somehow. They are incapable of imagination. They're only capable of writing about their own personal experience. Their power is their quote unquote authenticity. It's it's their it's the own voices idea. Um, not as a way to uplift, but as a way to put people into their boxes. Um, I was incredibly insulted. Uh, you know, no one else at these literary festivals, um, none of the white writers ever got the idea, got, no reader ever went up to them and said, you lied to me because you're nothing like the person you wrote about in your stories. Um, so why, why do I get this? Um, it was incredibly insulting. Um, and for a long time, I didn't know what to do. I was like, what? I, I, I don't feel like writing anymore because it's, it's like you write something and you're expecting to, for people to react to the human condition, to the universality of your imagination. Uh, but instead they want to figure out um, what is your relationship with your mom? You know, it's that kind of gossipy, uh, let's figure out what is going on with Ken uh, kind of reading, uh, which uh, is just incredibly uh, painful. Um, and then it took me a number of years to figure out my own way out of it, um, which is you kind of have to realize that this is just the nature of, of art. Um, and being an artist in a society that is not free of history and that isn't free of judgment, that isn't free of power dynamics. Yes, some writers do have the privilege because of their demographics to by default be judged as universal. Um, when they tell a story, it is just, people will just naturally interpret them as about imagination. They, they, um, they get the benefit of that. Some other writers don't. Um, and there's, you can complain about it, but it's not going to change. Um, things like that are structural. Um, that's what structural racism is about. In fact, the paper menagerie itself is a story about structural racism. Um, Jack uh, was told to hate himself because of the structure around him. Uh, he was, he was instilled with a sense of self-hatred and a sense of, um, uh, racial inferiority precisely because of the racial caste system in America. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, that was, that's what the story was about. And yet, um, you know, very few people would see it that way. Oh, here's another thing that I think is interesting. Um, a lot of the critical reception about the story tries to describe it this way. They say, this is a story about a biracial son born of a Chinese mother and an American father. And I, almost immediately point out that summary itself is structurally racist. How is she any less American than the father? Um, if you said Jack is the son of a Chinese, ethnically Chinese mother and an ethnically white father, I suppose I can see the point of it. But to say that the father is American and the mother is Chinese is incredibly um, racist. It's, there's that's no other word for it. Um, why is, Americanness equated with whiteness. Um, this country is made of immigrants. Um, a lot of us weren't born in this country, and that is the whole point. Um, this is the whole point. She has a claim on the American story and on the American identity just as valid as his father does. Um, and until Jack himself could sort that out, he would never feel at home. Um, and it's, you know, all the people around him try to tell him differently, but it's something that he had to sort of come to terms with himself. So I always sort of, uh, uh, you know, when I hear the story just taught in high schools or whatnot, it's often taught in this weirdly um, ethnic way. It's always treated as a story about otherness, about foreignness, about non-Americanness, but it's not. That's the whole point. By teaching the story that way, they have completely missed the point. The point is, these are all Americans, three Americans, an American family. This is the story of America. Um, and by denying her Americanness, they have replicated the structural racism that was imposed on Jack in the story. So outside of that digression, back to um, how I dealt with it. I had to sort of just accept that, you know, it's part of art. 
people will take a piece of art and fit it into their own story. Um, when a reader reads a story, the reader always packs it with their own understanding of how human nature works, their own back personal stories, their own personal mythology, their own interpretive frameworks, their own sense of what the words mean, their own sense of how power works, their own sense of the structural justice or injustice of the society they're living in. Um, and then they interpret the story and, and, and create a new story, really, out of the words that I put on the page. I have no control over how readers wish to do that. Um, and it's just that's part of creating art. Some writers um, are lucky in that the story they're trying to tell fits the interpretive framework that those in power use to interpret stories. Some of us don't get that benefit. Uh, it doesn't mean that we should stop creating art. It just means that we have to accept that maybe our stories will be misunderstood and misinterpreted more often. Um, and we're just going to have to keep on trying um, because uh, beyond the stories we tell, each other, there's also the grander story that we tell together as a people. Um, and I do believe that over time, the American story bends towards justice. And we will be able to tell an American story that is fair, just, inclusive, uh, and that doesn't just so callously claim that this is a story about a Chinese mother and an American father. Um, we will not I, I firmly believe that there will be a day when we'll move beyond this idea that because the father is white, he gets to be automatically treated as the representation, the representation of Americans. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what else I can add to this, uh, but it is one of those things where the story, the reception of the story taught me a great deal about the meaning of art and what it means to be an artist um, and how you have to um you can't you can't complain really um about the way your work is received uh because this is the world you live in um your art is not separate from life um you're gonna have to just accept that and keep on telling the story you want to tell uh and i always sign my books by telling uh the people who, are, who come to my uh to my events that i wish they get to tell the stories that they want to tell um and it's uh it's a it's a really sincere belief um and because i've seen so many of my fellow writers suffer from this you know there are tons of um writers who are trying to write about something that's wonderful universal uh that represent their deepest um understanding of human nature and it gets dismissed as you know oh this is just a story about a woman trying to talk about her personal experience. This is just a story about Mexican identity. This is just a story about, you know, black experience. Instead of um, treating these stories as universal, they're dismissed as somehow um, limited uh, to the, the demographic of the person who happened to write it. Um, and um, I, I, I feel that sense of, uh, of, of, of shared pain um, and in that, in that shared um, uh, dismissal, we also find our own strength. Um, and uh, I, I believe that, you know, um, it, it, it's not required for your story to be understood by everyone. All that is required is you understand what you're trying to tell. You have told the story to the best of your ability and that um, if someone does happen to understand it, then wonderful, and that should be celebrated. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on either the Paper Menagerie or on Pantheon, which is uh, a really wonderful show for me to work on. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I don't know how many episodes you guys got to see, um, but I, I really love the show. I think um, I think it's, it's a great story um, and uh, um, I'm proud to have worked on it. Great, great. Thank you so much, Ken. It was a wonderful talk. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so 
I'll, I'll open the floor um, to see if there is any, um, you know, um, anyone to ask the first round of questions. I will, I have a lot of questions, but I will save it for the students and the audiences. So um, is there anyone who wants to ask questions? I will save mine until you, know, you have the first opportunities. Um, yeah, do you wanna come up, come over here? Yeah. It's a pretty basic question. Yeah, it's okay. I can. Um, so I was a big fan of the Unwanted series, which is like science fiction, and like a big part of the Unwanted series is like the, the giving life to origami. And I was just wondering if you if you've read any of that series. No, I haven't. Uh, this is the first I've heard of it. Um, that's really cool. What's it called? Unwanted. The Unwanted. It's like a weird mix between Harry Potter and uh, the Hunger Games, but it's oh, pretty cool. Wow. That's cool. Uh, well, thanks for letting me know about it. I'll look it up. Um, I have not read it myself, no. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, anyone? Yeah. Can I just sit here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you feel, yeah. I can deliver your question too. Uh, I'm not sure if this really fits the book, but I was really touched when Jack's father said in the broken English sheet uh, that love is, if she says love in English, she just feels on her lips. But if she says I, she feels in her heart. And that kind of made me think about traditional Japanese as she might be born at the end of the period where they transition to um, oh, Japanese. You know what? I think you can just, yeah, it's too long to, 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 to <laughs> deliver. If you don't mind, I think it's better for you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, because the microphone is here. <laughs> If it's a key question, I can, you know. Uh, I was basically wondering if, what did you think about traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese? Because I was thinking that traditional Chinese can um, express more emotions in the characters. Um, so this is a complicated question because what we consider traditional Chinese is not traditional at all. And what we consider simplified is not simplified either. Um, so the evolution of Chinese characters as a writing system is, you know, it took place over millennia. And if you observe the evolution of the characters, components are being added or taken away over time. Um, so they've been simplified. They've also become more elaborate and they become simplified again. They become more elaborate. Um, so the simplification programs that have taken place to Japanese and to Chinese um, over time uh, represent a lot of different movements. So some of the movements to simplify the characters uh, involve simply phoneticizing. So using one character to represent multiple sounds. Uh, that's just part of the normal process of the evolution of a, of a language. Um, some of it is about taking the, um, what is called cao shu, um, or cursive writing, and taking those simplified strokes and making them formal strokes. Some of it involves taking folk uh, characters and making them formal characters. So the simplification process is not a one-time thing. It happened over a period of time, and there were many different attempts to do so. Now, the 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 way in the West we talk about traditional characters and simplified characters is to me kind of ludicrous because the traditional characters represent one snapshot of characters, and it was you know people had to decide these characters are going to be taken and these are going to be rejected. <laughs> so even the traditional characters we sort of think of is no more traditional really than the simplified characters themselves. They are both um, attempts to formalize language. It's sort of like standardized spelling. You know, if you go by Webster's spelling, are you really any more authentic in terms of spelling than if you were trying to spell the way uh, Chaucer did? Um, it's, they're just, you know, all attempts to authoritatively pin down a language that is in fact a script, I should say, that is in fact evolving and, and alive. Um, I also think that a lot of the discussion about simplified versus traditional uh, has become politicized in a way that is not helpful to what they really are. Um, 
simplification of characters was one of those things that um, those who have been educated under um, an influence of a Western mentality uh, have been pushing for for decades in China. Um, it eventually was pushed through under the People's Republic, um, and then it became associated with the People's Republic in a weird way. But it's not a creation of the People's Republic. The simplified characters were created long before and represent the work of many generations of scholars before that. So if you want to go back to those scholars' ideas and, and what they were trying to accomplish, which is to make the system more accessible to the general population, um, I don't think you can fault them for that. I, I think it's a wonderful attempt um, in the same way that the Japanese um, script also grew through through, the, through this simplification system. Um, on the other hand, trying to preserve the traditional characters, um, I also can't fault people for that uh, because there are there is a sense in which um, you know these are these can be arguments about aesthetics, they can be arguments about etymology, they can be arguments about um, what sort of historical memory you want to preserve in the characters because there is something to me. Um, a little sad about simplifying the character, say, for my last name, you know, the, the 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 traditional form, which is not even all that traditional, but we'll take the quote traditional form, which does encode more of the historical aspect of it than the simplified version, which is uses a simple cross as a substitution for a fairly complicated set of radicals on the left. And there is something to me a little bit emotionally um, sad um, about losing that part of it. Um, it's no different from, I suppose, um, you know, uh, during the French colonial era, when the Vietnamese stopped writing using Vietnamese versions of Chinese derived characters and switched using alphabet. Um, when you do that, you lose a lot of your connection to your ancestors, to your history, to your sense of your place. Um, but, you know, Vietnam went through that and uh, they're fine. Um, the, the loss will never be recovered, but they also gained a whole lot. So I think this is one of those things that you can't, anybody who comes down here and says one script is better than another script, uh, one script is categorically better than some other script is, you know, saying something that they really have no right to say, um, because no one has the power to make judgments like that. These are complicated uh, issues involving entire peoples. It's sort of like, you know, us, we're going through this complicated issue of, of spelling. Um, there are a lot of attempts and a lot of plans to simplify English spelling because, you know, English spelling is kind of a mess. Um, you know, compared to Spanish, um, English spelling is, is nonsense. Uh, the fact that we can even have something called a spelling bee is insane. I mean, most Languages that are alphabetical will not be able to have a spelling bee, but we do, uh, simply because of the way history is encoded. Now, if you were to say, let's abandon all of that, let's go back to a purely phonetic spelling system for English, I think a lot of us would feel kind of sad, because um, there is something wonderful about the fact that you can spell fish as G-H-O-T-I, right? Um, you know, G-H as in enough, right? Uh, oh as in women, and um, uh, T-I as in nation. So you end up with fish. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's sort of an extreme example, but we do, there is something about the way our spelling is, encodes so much history. So the layers of, 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 of what English went through, the way it, you know, the Anglo-Saxons were conquered and then they in turn became a great empire and, uh, the way English absorbed all these other languages and all these wonderful external um, imports. There's something really beautiful about the way English spelling, messy as it is, preserves all of that stuff. So there is something equally beautiful and wonderful about uh, Chinese characters preserving that history, that, that, that complexity of it. And anytime you try to simplify something like that and, and delete stuff, I think there is a sense of loss, but also at the same time, it's just another step in the evolution of the script. Um, so anyway, that's how I would think of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think of it as any other attempt to try to standardize or simplify English spelling. Um, it's just 
part of the way we we evolve. Um, and uh, I, I don't think either one or the other is necessarily better. Um, I will say that a lot of the goals of simplification were achieved, but there are also a lot of unintended unintended consequences um, that are also terribly sad. So do you value efficiency and ease of teaching and all of that? And do all of those things even matter in the age when most people are typing instead of handwriting? Um, I don't know. I don't know how to judge that. Uh, but you know, people have to make their decisions based on the moment. Um, and I can't fault the folks who tried to do simplification for not making the right choice. Um, they were making a very difficult choice trying to promote literacy um, at the cost of history and connectedness. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I can't say that they somehow did it wrong in the same way that modern Japanese readers will not necessarily be able to say <clears throat> that the Japanese character simplification system was somehow good or bad. They can't read the old Japanese text without specialized training anymore. But at the same time, it did do a lot to promote literacy. So what can you do? Um, I, I, I think a lot of things in the world are like that. Very hard to give a simple answer to. Thank you, thank you. Any other? Any other question? Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, I talk about how he likes to write in like a free form, like non label way. Uh, I wonder like, what inspired him to write. Okay. So the question was uh, about um, how you feel about your free form, like non labelable, you know, like this freedom of uh, labels, right? Categories of the genres, like what inspi inspires you to, you know, have this kind of like um, going out of the boxes kind of. Um, yeah. Job. So I don't even I don't think I I even tried deliberately to go inside a box or outside of a box. I I really just try to write stories that are emotionally resonant to me. Um, I would describe my style like as this. Um, I write fiction that's about literalizing what is otherwise merely metaphorical. So I take some aspect of reality that we discuss in metaphorical terms. And I make that metaphor literally true in my story, either through magic or through technology. Um, and then I try to just explore, uh, once you make the metaphor tangible and uh, literal, what would happen? Uh, so let me give you one example, right? Um, we often have this idea that love makes the world more vivid, more, uh, more colorful, more alive in some sense. That's that's obviously a metaphor. We don't literally mean that. Um, but what if it could be true, right? What if we're literally true? So that's what the paper menagerie is about. It's about love actually making the otherwise inanimate alive. Um, the sense of imbuing the the lifeless objects around us with an animistic soul. That's what that's about. Um, and it's motivated by love. Um, and uh, I, uh, another example of something like this would be, um, you know, we talk a lot about the alienation of modernity, this idea that we, because in modernity, we have to live with so many people, many, most of whom are strangers to us. And we, we you know, we evolved in, um, with a biological mental capacity to maintain close relationships with about 250 people, plus or minus. That's the way we evolved because we came out of hunter-gatherers, we came out of tribes. We That's the mental capacity that we evolved to have. So if we are forced to maintain ties with thousands of people or, or tens of thousands and, and having to interact with strangers by the millions, it is very hard for our brains to adjust to it. So modernity creates a lot of this sense of alienation, this loneliness in the middle of a crowd, right? Because we are able to maintain only about 250 close relationships. And yet in the modern world, no, because you're in college, you don't feel this. Most of your friends are right near you. and But this is the last time in your life where that will be true. Um, once you leave college, you will live in this world in which most of your close friends are not nearby. They're not gonna be accessible to you by walking 
um, you will have to make an effort to see people and you may see your extended family only once a year, if that. Um, it's a deeply unnatural, weird way for us to live in the modern world. And we don't, we're not adjusted to it because how can we? It's only been a few generations since we've been doing this. So we have the sense that either the people around us are not real, that they're robots, or somehow we're the only individuals with deep inner lives. Um, so that's a metaphorical sense, the sense of alienation, of, of, of being the only player character surrounded by NPCs. But what if you make that literally true? What if you make that the literal reality? Meaning there are, in fact, people walking around who are just robots with no authenticity behind them, with no real inner lives. Um, and you have to actually apply some sort of test to figure out which are the real humans and which are the robots. Um, and what might a test like that look like? Um, maybe you test for empathy. Maybe empathy is what humans are all about. Then you end up with a story like, do androids dream of electric sheep? Um, better known to most people as Blade Runner. So Blade Runner to me is not a sci-fi story in the sense that it, it's not really about robots or AI or any of that. It's really about sense of alienation. It's about this idea that we don't know if other people are real um, because the modern world forces us to live with too many people. Um, that's what I think Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is really about. So that's the style of sci-fi or fantasy I write. I don't go out there and write sci-fi and fantasy because I think the genre themselves are very attractive to me. Um, I'm neutral on the genre. Um, I'm attracted to the idea of making what is otherwise merely metaphorical, literally true. Um, you know, somebody like Margaret Atwood does that too. Um, they, she takes, you know, what is otherwise a me mere metaphor um, and tries to make it literally true in a lot of her fiction. Um, and um, there's something really powerful about making a metaphor tangible, making it literally true, because now you can examine it from directions you can't do otherwise. And you reveal aspects about reality that you can't see otherwise. I think of the style of fiction as applying a kind of distorting lens to reality. Um, and when you do that, you see things you don't otherwise see. Um, you know, for example, uh, epic fantasy is one of the only ways in which in literature we can explore things themes like the fate of a nation um, national mythos national identities um, these are just too abstract too big for realist fiction um, modernism has moved fiction to be very internal oriented it's very much about the internal reality and psychology of the individual character um, and if you were to write a realist novel about the fate of nations, <laughs> the, the, the American story, um, it would come across as deeply ridiculous. Um, we're just not in the mode to deal with that in a realist mode anymore. But you can talk about stuff like that in epic fantasy um, using metaphors. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, what draws me to writing this style of fiction. It's not that I set out to write sci-fi or fantasy. Um, I'm just very neutral about these labels. If people want to label my fiction that way, um, that's totally fine, um, and they enjoy it, great. But if they label my fiction and then say your fiction is really not that, then you know my answer is I never did label them. You're the one who applied those labels to it. Um, I don't claim my fiction is any of those things. Um, my fiction is really just about literalizing a metaphor, uh, and that's what I do. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think we have like two, three more minutes. So maybe one last question. Um, yeah. And while you're thinking of your questions, I, I have a question. Um, so you finished this <clears throat> long Dandelion uh, Dynasty series, right? The yeah. uh, And it's, you know, getting harder and harder to uh, even for me, like read and digest like long novels, like not only like, like, you know, not mentioned to like assign long novels in college literature courses. Right. So, um, but I'm trying to assign, you know, you know at least first novel of your uh, dynasty series next semester, at least a few in you know, a first like hundred pages or so, but like, I just wondering how you feel 
about the completion of this long series, like this like long word view, long historical like scope. Um, and people, you know, like talk about this like creation invention of a new genre, like silk punk, which is, you know, developed yeah. like solar punk, um, you know, like steampunk, cyberpunk. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I feel very relieved and uh, a little bit sad uh, having finished uh, the series. So for those of you who don't know, um, the Dangguan Dynasty is the only uh, long form fiction um, I've ever written. Um, it's it's four books. They're, they're very long, very massive. It took me a decade to write. Um, it's, it represents the vast majority of my creative output during that decade. Um, and it's something I'm very proud of uh that I, I got to do now i'm very proud of it not because really of any external reason i i don't know how um i've heard from some readers who love it and and um uh, uh but you know i i don't really know how it affects other people it is however one of those things where i wrote the story i wanted to write um and and i got to tell the story i wanted to tell and that's pretty awesome to me um you know, for the longest time, the biggest challenge was just finishing it. Um, I felt like one of those workers on the Sphinx or the Great Pyramids or something where all you can see is this little bit right in front of you and you're trying so hard to work on it. And you have no idea what the shape of the whole thing is because, you know, the books are so long that it takes me about a year to revise a draft from beginning to end. And I have to make the revision passes multiple times. Um, the the last book, um, which um, was very long, it actually took 18 months to just go from the beginning to the end to do one revision pass. And it's very hard to maintain psychological focus on that because you just constantly feel like it's overwhelming. Um, you know, it's very hard to overcome the sense of despair, the sense of, of, of trying to tell a story that's so much bigger than you are. And I was very encouraged, um, you know, by reading a lot of Milton during that time. Uh, Milton was somebody who also tried to write a, a very big story. Um, and he, you know, was very open about his own struggles. And he talked about how it just felt so, so big. And he, he couldn't really he felt like he was inadequate to the story that he was trying to tell and, and, and yet he wanted to do it. Um, and I really identified with a lot of what he said uh, about the poetics of trying to tell a grand story that you don't feel like you're up to. Um, and I kept on struggling and, 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 and went through it. Um, and like I was telling you earlier, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Um, it is done. Uh, and um, I will say though that Having taken me a whole decade to write this one series, I don't think I will be writing another series anytime soon, perhaps ever. Uh, I may stick to standalone novels in the future. Um, so for those of you who are interested in writing these epic fantasies, um, just be warned that it may be the case that you do one of these and, and you're done. Um, I have friends who do a series like this every couple of years and they have you know 50 books um and i i really admire that i i you know just this one time took me a whole decade i can't imagine doing this over and over again but there are some writers who are just built like that they can do it um i am not one of them one yeah. is enough for me all right great all right uh i think time is up thank you so much for joining uh joining us today and thank you great. everyone real pleasure and thanks after you yeah, I'll see you soon. I'll send you an email. Um, and okay. thank you so much. Have a great rest right. of the day. Bye, everyone.